Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 285 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron. I'm levitating with how excited I am about today's show. Today, I am talking to Eileen Lambert. And um, remember last week when I was saying, oh my God, this is something I don't talk about enough is how you feel after you get a re revision letter from an editor. Um, Eileen is a student of mine, a past student of mine. And she was the one I was speaking about this topic with. And uh, she was so excited about it. And I was so excited to talk with her on email. And we decided to have this conversation on the podcast. And it's something I do not hear talked about. I can't remember hearing this talked about in detail ever on any podcast. I'm sure people do, but I cannot remember hearing it. We had a fantastic time and I just adore this woman. And I know you are going to enjoy that. So that is coming up. What is going on around here? Well, oh my gosh, I just had the most enjoyable lunch break. It's summer in New Zealand, and you may be able to hear the cicadas that are singing in the background. It's a gorgeous day. It is uh, 78 degrees in my office, which is a little warm, and it's probably about 75 outside. Uh, we, my wife and I just took a break. Um, actually, we took a break because the house cleaners were coming in. And so we went downtown and we went to this place where I got a bowl of incredibly spicy homemade noodles with fried spam and all of these vegetables. I do not even know what to call it, but it was a, the happiest bowl of anything that I think I've ever eaten. We ate it in a park. Then we went to a bookstore and met a bookseller um, because of things having to do with trying to get Hush Little Baby into an international edition through Penguin Random House New Zealand. Um, chatted to somebody there. And got a coffee and a salted caramel slice bar. Brought that back here. Y'all, I got a parking ticket. I got a parking ticket. And uh, in American dollars, it's like $25. And I'm thrilled to pay it. It's my first parking ticket. It's a rite of passage um, in San Francisco. It's like, what, $115 American? Uh, so I don't know. I'm just, I'm feeling rather high on life in Wellington and spicy food. And, oh, I ran into a friend who was getting a tattoo, popped in and chatted to him while he was having a tattoo, because that is what happens in Wellington. The other day, so I meet more people than Lala does, because I, I have more groups that I go out and interact with, although I'm doing that a lot less now with Omicron. Um, but Lala ran into a friend at the bookstore, a different bookstore the other day. Uh, so oh, it's, it's just, it's good. It's good. Anyway, You've heard me say this, but I am very, very glad to live here. Let's see what I say in the winter, um, but it will probably be something similar. Uh, okay, what's going on around here business-wise? I finished the book. I finished complete. And uh, I think I mentioned last week that my editor is actually not quite ready for it. So she gave me another couple of weeks. So I've spent this week polishing, doing some fiddly stuff. I mean, we could polish and fiddle with our books forever before sending them to an editor. Um, so... I think tomorrow is my last day of working on it, even though I have an extra week after that. Tomorrow is the last day. I'm basically up to the last two chapters of the pass that I'm doing right now. It's a quick um, language pass. And um, then it will be off and I will start on the novel that I am so, so very excited to write. So that's going well. Classes are going well. Um, New Zealand is opening up to travel for New Zealand citizens and permanent residents. Oh my God, Lala became a permanent resident. She got her permanent resident visa. So she's no longer on a work visa. She can stay here as long as she likes. She can come and go uh, for basically forever. She now belongs to New Zealand. She has all the rights and responsibilities as a New Zealand citizen. She gets to vote. It only took five months um, since we put in the initial permanent resident application. And I think that's because for the last two years, New Zealand has only let in citizens and their partners. So their backlog of clearing people and getting them through the system was really fast. So what was I saying? Oh, yes. Uh, New Zealand is opening up in March, which makes me feel good because since we have lived here, uh, it has been the case that if we had to go back to the States for a medical emergency or something like that in the family, God forbid, we wouldn't be able to get back in um, the quarantine system. There has been, I, I, I think it's like 200,000 
Kiwis trying to get back into New Zealand and can't because they couldn't get a space in the quarantine lottery. Um, so that's going to change in mid-March, which I didn't really feel like it was a burden to me, but having that burden lifted does make me feel good. It means that my sisters could jump on a plane to, oh, well, in March when it's, when it starts, they would be able to jump on the next plane to New Zealand because they're both citizens. I could jump on a plane and go to the States and then be able to come home, home to Wellington when I wanted to. So that is exciting news too. So I don't know. It's just, it's all good around here. Um, let us jump into this interview because it's fantastic. It's going to blow your mind. I loved talking to Eileen. Let me give you a little bio for her. Eileen Lambert is an emerging writer based in San Francisco. She is editing her first novel, Meet Me at Blackbird, which explores themes of power, privilege, and gender. Eileen is driven by the stories we tell ourselves and how to change those stories to better serve us. She is the founder of Stax Studio, where she will be teaching classes on how to shift mindsets, process emotions, and get unstuck using a playful combination of writing and cardboard art. She believes the writing process is a metaphor for life, and her mission is to to help people create their own story one box at a time. She will be launching her first course, Confronting Your Inner Critic, this spring. So please enjoy the interview, my friends. Well, I could not be more pleased to welcome Eileen to the show. Hello, Eileen. Hello, Rachel. Hello. Uh, before we get started, will you tell us your whole name, and, full name and your pronouns, please? My name is Eileen Lambert and my pronouns are she, her. I'm thrilled to see your face. First of all, like I have missed you. I miss you too. I miss you too. I, I mean, stalk you, but <laughs> I haven't seen you like this in a while. <laughs> like this face to face yeah. on Zoom, which is how we know each other. Even though when I lived in the States, we didn't live far away from each other, but it was the pandemic and nobody was getting together. So Eileen is a student of mine, a past student of mine, and a little bit of um, history with us. We did 90 days to done. Um, which is my class on first drafting. And then we did 90 day revision. And then we did some grad classes together. And um, you are one of the people who you finished your book. You did it. You finished your book and then you revised your book and then you revised your book again. And recently you have been going through the editing process with an editor. And, um, and you've had some revelations that I want to hear from you about and I've had some revelations about the way I present things like I need to talk more about what getting an editor's letter is really like, but let's start at the top. Um, how do you come to writing? That's a great question. And a you, big were question. Much, you were my gateway person. Um, so I read your uh, fast draft, your memoir in 90 days. I and... didn't even know that that's how you got to me. Yes. I couldn't remember. Yes. Yes. Um, and the book was so affirming and I've never read a writing book like that ever. And actually, to be honest with you, I haven't really read a writing book like that since, oh. um, which is a little piece of advice I'd love to give later about craft books, which is be very careful because they could be very shaming. Yes. Um, yes. That's a really good point. Yes. And so a lot of the books that I had kind of touched on over the years were all about how new beginning writers struggle with this, they struggle with that. Of course, the exactly the things I was struggling with. And so I kind of shut the book and was like, this is not for me. So you had this very affirming approach. Every single chapter was like a reminder that you can do this, you will do this. And so I wrote to you personally, Rachel. Um, I, re I, I remember that vaguely. Yes, I do remember this. Tell me more. And all I said was, I don't want to be a writer, but all I said was, <sighs> I've never read a book like this. And I just want to let you know, like you are badass, amazing and good on you. And we started this dialogue back and forth That's and you're asking right. about writing. And I was like, I do morning pages, you know, three, like three pages free write in the morning, but I'm not a writer. And I kept, you know, the narrative was like, I'm not a writer. I'm not a writer. You know what it's and reminding me of is like, and this literally happened to me. Like I was not dating when I met my wife, I was not dating. I was not going to date. I was not interested in dating. And I meant it with all of my heart. Yeah. And then I met Lala and this, that's kind of what this sounds like. I am not a writer. Exactly. Go exactly. on. What happened next? And then you emailed me one random day and said, I have a spot left in my 90 days to dine class. Would you like it? And I was like, oh my God. Uh, yes. And I remember signing up right away. I was like, if I have any time to think about this, I won't do it. And so I just, I did, I paid in full. There was no like 
month to month, it was just, I am fully in. I'm, this is it. I'm in. So that's how, that's how I came to writing. But you, the thing is you were, you were a writer. You were a writer. You are a writer. You were a writer before you knew you were a writer. And that's why you had read that book. Yes, yes, yes. Now I need to say one more thing about the book, which yes. is very interesting as we get into first drafting. The title of the book to somebody who's a complete newbie suggested in my thinking that the whole thing was going to be done in 90 days and maybe like a publisher would come knocking on my door. Oh yeah, so- <laughs> totally. People, people oh. get that. It's uh, it's a, it's a, I won't call it clickbaity, but it is clickbait adjacent because uh-huh. in the book I make clear, like it ain't going to happen that way, but the title, <laughs> the title yes. gets them in the door. <laughs> but for somebody who's very, which I used to be very outcome-based and very yeah. goal-based, it was like, if I read this book, and I do what she says, then I will have this. Yes. And so I just wanted to, to, to touch on that before we go any further, because actually what I found was the complete opposite, which was the process. And that's mm-hmm. what changed my life. I think if it had been 90 days and I had drafted something and it was you know perfect right out of the gate and went to a publisher and the rest of it, I never would have had all these wonderful gifts that I've had over the last year. Absolutely. I was just writing about this this afternoon that um, I'm so thankful that most, you know, 99% of us have to write a crappy first draft first, because that is where we learn. And if I were to write something and never have to think about it again, and never have to question it and never have to make it better and better and better, people would just get my first thought, which is not my best thought. My best thought is the 17th thought I've had about something. Okay. So then what did you learn about first drafts, um, in, in that, in that book? So first drafting has honestly has changed my life. It really has. I I know I always talk about writing being a metaphor for life, but first drafting is definitely this idea of just jumping in and being allowed to make mistakes. There are so few parts of my life where I've been able to do that, or I've I've allowed myself permission to do that. Um, And when I say first drafting, I mean, it's your definition of first drafting. I don't, can we can truly we shitty first drafting? Yes. Okay. <laughs> shitty. You, you threw it out first, <laughs> but it's, it's, and I don't think I ever really understood that until I was like really deep into the first draft. You kept saying like they're crappy words, just bang them out. The faster you go, like you're trying to tap into something deeper, more subconscious. You're trying to get in the flow and it's not, it's just not how I was taught to, to, it certainly wasn't how I was taught to write in school, but I'd never had this opportunity to really sit down and say, and I've actually, I fast drafted twice now because I did the, the first book. And then as I was waiting for the edits, I was so scared to not be a writer anymore that I went and fast drafted a second novel during NaNoWriMo. So I, I feel like I really understand now if you can really open up, I mean, really, truly open up, like there are no mistakes and actually the mistakes that we make are the pieces of the adventure where the book turns and, yes. and pivots. And sometimes a tiny little mistake can change the entire narrative of the story. So the thing that I learned about first drafting, and like I said, this applies to so many things in my life, the, some of the hobbies I've taken up recently and whatnot is just dive in. Like if you know that you can't, if you know that you can't, I don't even wanna say screw up because the idea is, is to, create a framework where you can make mistakes, Mm -hmm. but to embrace those and understand that those actually are part of the process. And that's this idea of sitting down and saying, okay, I'm going to start at the top line and I'm just going to go down. And when I'm all, and when I'm all done, the book's going to be done. That, that, that's just not how it's, that, that's not how, that's not how art is created. Right. I think the, I think the reason that it takes so many times for people to hear that and internalize that. And I swear to God, it took me like 35 years to internalize this, um, this concept is that I think so many writers and and human beings perhaps are perfectionists by nature and by necessity. Like I was talking about the driving example. You can't drive and make all the mistakes. You just can't do it. You can't raise a child and not pay attention to the child and make all the mistakes. Like you, the, our whole lives are set up not to make mistakes and we are perfectionists and we do have great t- taste when it comes to literature. And when we read our own work and it's not good enough, it's so easy to walk away. I also want to just jump in here and say really quickly, Eileen and I are not talking today because I want this to be any kind of advertisement for my book or for my classes. The reason you and I are talking is that something kind of fundamental shifted in you in the last couple of weeks. And you emailed me and said, can we talk about this? Um, Because I'm feeling a little bit self-conscious about trying not to sound like an advertisement, but I'm so excited 
about what has happened with you and this book. Okay. So you've got this crappy first draft. You embraced it. You did it. You finished it. I remember you finishing that book because I will say, um, I guess this is where I started to go with this is that you are not a person who does this naturally. I could call you perhaps a perfectionist in some things, correct? Like you, you, Eileen, like to know how to do something well. And you are one of those people in my classes who asks all of the questions because there is that, can I say nervousness or anxiety about I'm getting it wrong. I'm getting it wrong. I'm screwing it up. Can you, can you tell me how to do this part? Um, so you lived in that, you got, you got comfortable with the discomfort. You finished the first draft. And then, um, what did you learn about revision that surprised you? (laughs) (laughs) So I, was surprised at how shitty the first draft was. The second, <laughs> if I'm really yes, honest, yes. It was like, oh my god, I wrote that because, and I think the, I think the piece that was, a couple things. When I went back to the first draft, I started at the beginning, right? I went to right. page one, so I'm looking at, and the other thing that you, um, that you uh, encourage, I would even say, profess, is to start at the beginning and move forward. That momentum yes. piece is huge. So if anything changes or there's a, there's a, there's a plot change or somebody is somebody's brother or sister or whatever, something changes like that, you make the change in the document where you are, you don't go back and change it historically and you move forward. And so when I came to page one, like the first sentence that I had written at the beginning of the 90 days, I mean, it was shocking at how bad it was. And a lot of this process for me has been about shifting my own narrative around my writing, the process, and like what the expectation is, if that makes sense. And so when I came back to this, and I remember you were so clear about this, the reason that those words look so awful is because you are so much more advanced. Now you have 90 days of having been down at your computer every day writing. And I really did. I wrote every day for the 90 days. I mean, there might've been a couple of days, but I had the accountability calendar. I mean, I was, I was, was but you had 90 days of learning what this book was about. And yes. then you finish the book and then you go back to day one when you knew nothing about the book. Like you, you enter the book, you think, you know what the book is about and, and books buck you. They're that, they're that wild animal and it throws you off. And yes, you look at that first day, those for that first scene and you're like, oh crap, what now? Exactly. Exactly. I think I also misunderstood what revising was yeah. just Many, like I thought most people just do. Like I, just like I thought 90 days to done was I'm done. I thought revising was about, and actually I felt the same way about editing. I thought revising and editing were about going back and yeah. making some typo changes, yeah. maybe pulling out a few sentences, but basically somehow I had created this idea in my mind that my shitty first draft, when I had it all like packaged together would be like fixable. Well, when I opened it, it did not feel fixable at all. That's, that's what that's why I'm so excited to talk to you about this, because that's what people don't talk about when it comes to revision. What we are taught in school and in grad school is revision is editing. It is going back and making the sentences prettier and tighter and getting rid of the typos and making them more lyrical. But we, but what you learned and what writers who finish books learn is that you have to take the whole book apart. It's like, it's like the car broke down. You cannot just add um, another can of oil to it, to fix it. Yeah. You have to take the engine apart and put it back together and maybe add some new things and take out some other things, all the bolts that didn't need to be there. You're, you're working on those and it's, and it is not easy, but in order to write a good book, it's essential. Absolutely. And, and Absolutely. you did it. Well, and this is where structure comes in. I mean, structure yeah. again, as a reader, I, I, I can't say I ever really knew what that was. Uh, it was a, it was a, a, yeah, I'm trying not to beef up your classes so much. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not, like, it just, it was, I don't know how I would have done it without it. Let's just, let's just say, I, I really don't know how I would have been able to craft a story without understanding structure. And I can see how it's easy because I saw it in my shitty first draft to just kind of, I mean, that's what it is, right? It's just kind of a dump, like yes. it's creative, you know, all the juices are flowing in the rest of it, but it needs to have structure. And so a big part of the revision process for me was lay, laying that structure, right? So having the four act structure and, and, and moving things around a lot. I wasn't even looking for typos or, or beautiful prose or anything. In fact, I'm not even sure I've done that yet at this point. Um, but the structure was this 
I think it felt like a very, um, it, it gave me a certain level of confidence in my writing because I felt like there was, there was, there was a, a framework or something it could lay over, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Yes. So I didn't feel in the shitty first draft, I felt like I was kind of swimming and drowning and the rest of it, which is, I think, part of the process on purpose. Mm-hmm. But then the revision, when the, when the structure comes in, it's kind of like, if you want to make this work, let's move all these little components in. And then my favorite word is the schlunk. <laughs> uh, tell us about the schlunk because you so and I schlunk. share the schlunk. We do. We share the slunk. So the schlunk is a moment and I've shared this with other writers. They love the word. And I can, I can remember coming onto Slack and being like, oh my God, it's two in the morning. I'm having a schlunk. I'm having a schlunk. A schlunk is when like two plot points or, or, or a character and a motivation, some piece of the story, and it can be so tiny fits. And it's, it's, it's a speeding ticket that you weren't expecting someone to get, or it's the fact that the father was really the cop and he's the one that gave the speeding ticket or the fact that they weren't even driving cars. And this was all about bicycles and like this. And, and the it schlunks, fits together. It fits together. And the schlunks for me were what kept me going. Cause uh-huh. then it was this realization of the writing may not be very good and the words may not be right, but this is turning into be a really good story. And that was very, Again, it was like the same, I felt it very much in the first drafting process, but also in revision. Momentum for me at least is very important. I need to keep moving forward. And that was what scared me with when the edits came back was all of a sudden I was like, this is, I can't, like, I don't know how to go forward and I can't, right? So I don't, I don't know. So let's sense. talk about, so so in 90 day revision, okay, I, I'm going to um, take my classes out of it for a second. And I will just say to people, if you are not on my writer's emailing list, you can go to rachelherron.com slash write. And I will eventually send you everything I know about structure. I send you a thing on revision. So you can get all this for free. Go sign up for that. Now we're going to go back to, so in 90 day revision, you did your big second draft, the make sense draft where it made sense. And then you did the third draft and then you did the passes. And this is what we talk about in those classes. And you're getting closer and closer to this book being as good as you can make it. How did it feel when you got to this book being as good as you could make it by yourself? It felt amazing. Um, I did a couple of things that um, were very important to me for my own process. Um, I noticed that writing to a deadline or at least having some structure around the time that I'm allowing myself to complete something is very important. And so I, and I guess this is, I think someone was saying to me, you know, you're a writer when your deadline is October 31st, because you so desperately want to do NaNoWriMo. So I really, I remember when you chose that. Yes. I really wanted to do NaNoWriMo and I was far enough along that I was pretty sure I could get there by October 31st. And there was something about those last few weeks where it was just, you know, really cranking it out. Um, and I love the way you phrase that because I think it's a really important distinction. It's at least for a, for a beginning writer. It's not when the book is done. It's when the book is as far as you can get it. And that, that was, that was again, another narrative I had to shift for myself because I was expecting this, you know, sort of Stephen King level type book. Now that I've done the edits or not even edits, I guess, revisions at this point, um, I'll be so close. And uh, I thought it would feel a little bit different if that makes sense. Um, it felt like it made sense. I used some amazing tools. I mean, I literally had something, um, called the tool, which is like an Excel spreadsheet that has all of the different scenes as I'm going through and the impact on the character's, uh, transformation on the character arc. And if there are other things I need to add, I mean, I I had really, the schlunks were really happening. Right. So, but I got it to a point where it needed to go to an editor because it was, like I said, it was as far as I could get it. And, and I wasn't sure how to fix it. And so I think because I had told myself that, I expected, and this is where the disconnect happened, I expected that the that the editor's letter, and I had a developmental edit. So I don't know if you want me to explain what that yeah, is. Yeah, 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 do please. So a developmental edit is, um, and, and I think it's worth explaining again, because I, yeah. I originally thought edits were sort of copy line edits, whatever, she's right. gonna move around chapters, this kind of thing. So developmental edit is essentially the editor looks at the book, and at the manuscript and comes back with um, a, you know, six to seven page letter that talks about like the big, like top level stuff, right? Like what's the structure like? What are the characters like? What's the pacing like? You know, these big, and, and I knew that that's what the editor was going to be doing. 
But the disconnect was I thought the editor was going to tell me how to fix everything. So I thought the editor was going to come back and say, um, you know, uh, uh, not feeling very connected to these two characters. Have you thought about doing X, Y, and Z? Your choice, but have you thought about doing X, Y, and Z? And there was none of that. So what I received on a date that I was expecting and anticipating and waiting for, and you know, my family knew about it, like this was a really big deal, was a document that told me everything that was wrong with my book. And I totally fell off a cliff. I totally fell off a cliff. You did fall off a cliff. Yeah. yeah. And I went into the whole imposter syndrome, like I'm not really a writer and this isn't a great story. And I can't believe I took it this far. And then I got into this kind of bargaining place where I said, my original goal was X, I've achieved that. That goal expanded in the revision process, I've achieved that. And my goal, like the goal that made me feel really good was that I got the book to an editor. And so now I'm bargaining and saying, I completed that. Like, I don't really need to put this out in the world. And I went into this thing where I was like, this can't go out into the world. It's right. so awful. Right. And so what I wanted to say to anybody who is going through the editing process, this is really important. And it made a really big difference for me is the editor's letter does not just include everything that's wrong with your book. It also, I'm assuming includes positive things and mine did too. And so what I did after I fell off the cliff and I realized I was going to claw my way back, 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 back up, um, was I took her letter, I saved a, a copy of it and I went through and I deleted everything that was, that was wrong. And I had some really nice little nuggets that were positive things that a professional editor said about my book. What a great idea to just look at those because they are impossible to see when you're yeah. looking at the problems. And here's something I want to point out for everybody listening too. We pay editors or we work with editors um, to tell us what's wrong with the book. And we sometimes forget that it is so hard to hear those things. And I personally, when I send a book out, I know it is as good as I can make it. And this I'm always hoping is the one time that they're going to write back and go, you're right. You got yeah. it. You nailed it. I think there's some, there's some typos. You should fix those. Um, but the, the beautiful thing about an editor's letter is they point out where you can get stronger and, and most editors will give you praise as well there. I have worked with a couple of editors who do not. So you only hear the bad things, but what I have done kind of like what you did is basically say, if she didn't talk about that part of the book, that means she, she liked it. She, yeah. it, it is, it is good because yeah. she didn't talk about it, but that's harder. It's really nice if you have some positive things. So, okay. So you deconstructed the letter and then what? Yes. So then I was left with all of these edits that it was a complete narrative shift for me personally was she has shown me not just what's wrong with my book. And this is the key. She has shown me where I can make the book stronger. Yes. And that little shift, it's changed yes. everything. For me, Rachel. It's, it's, it's like, it's a completely different way of looking at it. And now I'm so jazzed because I agree. And the other thing is, you know, I mean, maybe there are some disconnects with, with, editors and, and, and writers, but the big picture stuff, it wasn't like she said something. I was like, come on. I worked so hard on that. You know, it was, it was the, one of the big ones that came up was the the relationship between Roland and Maria. And I was like, that came up in class that came up in revision. That's always been my kind of Achilles heel. And I kind of thought like, thank God she did spot it because if she thought it was okay, then that would be another story. Right. So I have always said that editors don't, don't let me get away with my bullshit because I always think like I, you know, if I have a Roland and Maria situation going on, I'll be like, I'm sending it with my fingers crossed. I hope I, I hope I bet I nailed it. And when they re respond back saying you didn't nail it, I've ne it's not out of the blue. Yeah. I knew that. And they're confirming that, yes, this is a place I can make it better. So, yeah. so basically she's giving you this tool. It's the most perfect tool that you will ever have for your books yes. is this yeah. person, this professional, not a friend, but a professional telling you where yeah. it needs to be better. Yeah. Absolutely. I also recommend having, I don't know if this is the norm, but I also recommend having a phone conversation with your editor. It can be the I, norm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It often, so it often received, is. Yeah. Okay. I received everything by email and I just said, I, I just, it's not even like I have specific questions. I just, I need to hear your voice. I need to hear, you know, I need to have a little bit of, of discourse. So that really helped. So where I'm at now is I took the rest of the document, which is everything that need to be needed to be changed. And 
I went through, I went into the manuscript. That was a huge moment. And actually every time there's been a shift, like from first drafting to revision, make sense draft to editing, opening that manuscript when there's been a little break has been the scariest thing. Like, I don't even want to read the words. I think they're going to be terrifying. Yeah, yeah. It's terrifying. We, it's we, terrifying. we begin to believe that it is actually impossible, that we are not yes. smart enough to do it this time. We've reached, I always think, feel like I've yes. reached the top of my smarts and I can't go higher. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So I opened the manuscript and uh, I did a scene outline, a fresh scene outline. And just going through the story, I was like, again, and she said that she's like, you've got a great story. here." So the structure, yes, worked. <laughs> and, but it was refreshing to be able to see that, you know, it was, yes. it was, it yes. was important for me to be able to lock back into where she had it for six weeks. So it was, it was a place for me to kind of lock back into the story and the rest of it. But then when I made the scene outline, I was already feeling these tiny little schlunks where I'm like, okay, she wants more of this. That's where it could go. Oh my God. So, yes. So where I'm at now, and it's, it really is, it's so thrilling because it's, it's like I said, this is going to make the book so much better. Where I'm at now is I've got the scene outline. I've got three documents open. I've got passes which is a list of things that I need to do as a pass that aren't specific things um, that can go into the scene outline. I have the scene outline, and then I have the list of all the edits that she suggested and some things that came up in a, in a hot seat I did with my writing group. So what I'm doing is I'm taking, and this is the part that is so much fun because it's just schlunk after schlunk after schlunk, is taking something as top level as, let's take Roland and Maria, for example, um, needing more backstory, right? That's one of the things that came up. I need more backstory on their relationship. And where can I do that? And how can I do it? And yes. that's where the scene outline comes yes. in. So I've got this top level thing that needs to be created. Is it a pass? Like, is it something in their dialogue? Is it a, is it, is it a, is it a, a, a cute name that he calls her? Okay, that goes in the past section. But if it's in the scene outline, I literally go scene by scene, and I ask myself, like, is that somewhere I could do it? And how am I going to do it? And so I give myself the instruction of what I'm going to do right inside the scene outline. And so I've been doing this, you know, for the last, I mean, I've, it may have only been a week, but I'm not, I'm not inside the manuscript. I'm doing all of this yes. in yeah. an edited document, edit focused document, if that yes. makes sense. Yes. And th those will then be my marching orders when I go into the manuscript. I love that you call it marching orders. That's perfect. It is, you've, you're building this map as we call it. And you had the Roland Maria problem, let's call it. And in, in our parlance in the classes, we talk about that as a post-it. You, you have a problem with Roland and Maria. You've got this post-it and you're looking at your scene outline, your sentence outline to see where in each scene you may be able to thread some of these things that have been flagged to you again. And I want to, I want to point out a couple of things here. Um, the way you are talking about your book and about how writing works and how revision works, you are an expert. And I've told you this before, and I, I feel like perhaps you are, are believing it. You know what the hell you are talking about. And it's a repeatable process. And I think that's, and that's the second thing I wanted to bring up was when, was when you sent me the SOS email last week. I mean, it was SOS. It was SOS. I'm lying down on the train tracks right after I burned my manuscript. Um, and I, all I did, all I did, Eileen, was I pointed out, you have every single tool. It's a repeatable process. You're just doing exactly what you did in the second draft and the third draft. And you're yeah. doing it with this invaluable tool that you got from an editor. Yeah. 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 And after and, you heard that, you wrote me that, tell me, yeah, tell me what you're going to say. And I was just going to say the other thing that I learned through all of these different phases is that, and I, I love this expression because it's so true about life is your future self will know. Yes. I am a different yes. person with this manuscript yes. than I was at the beginning of 90 days to done. I know, I know so much about these characters. Yeah. I'm still actually getting to know them, but I know so much about the characters that the decisions I'm making, I just simply didn't have the experience with them. It really is. It's just, it's getting to know them. And the only place you get to know them is yes. inside the By manuscript. Sitting down and doing yes. the work you yes. could never. And I think that's where people get really frustrated is they want to sit down on the couch, get out a piece of paper and figure out the problems with the book. And, yes. you know, before they are, you know, in their first draft or in their second draft and figure out how to make everything work, but you can't do that until you're doing the work. And every time you do the work, you're learning more and future Eileen is figuring yes. out the stuff that past Eileen 
did not have the knowledge, the, the information to make those decisions that you're able to make, not always easy. It's not always easy to make those decisions, but it's always easier. Yeah. And sometimes it's easy. You're like, oh yeah, I know how to, I know how to do that. I know how to fix that one. Well, it's interesting that you use those words because that's kind of where I'm at now. Now that, and here's the next part of it's kind of like the ninja next level part of editing is once, once I reached the later stages of creating this editing document. So again, I'm not in the manuscript. I have not made the changes because there's so much working out that happens in the pay on the page. It is kind of starting to feel easy because yes. now, for example, I've added a new character. It's not a big deal. It's not, it's, it's a juicy one. It's going to be a big deal. But because I've added a new character, then some of the other things she commented on, yes. it's like tick, tick, tick. That's easy. That guy can be the one who says it. That guy can be the one who does that. Does that make sense? So it's, it makes sense. And it is so satisfying. It's so satisfying sometimes that you, you feel like you're cheating. Yes. Like it shouldn't, it shouldn't be this easy, but it is because you've done so much damn work on this mm -hmm. book. You are so far away from that crappy first draft. You're not even in the same country anymore. You're, you're working with a book that already works and you're yeah. making it better with what yeah. you know and the tools yeah. that you have. That's very well. That's very well said. Exactly. Yeah. I have goosebumps with <laughs> what you are doing and with what you have been doing and shout out to your community too. You, you created a community around yourself. Wow. I mean, the community that again, I, I mean, I met them through you, Rachel, they're just phenomenal. Yeah, but and you kept them. I, you know, I'm not part of that community anymore. You all meet and support each other on do. a, on, do you, on a, like a weekly basis or something? I'm not even sure. We meet, we meet once a week for oh. what I would call our sort of like writer's support, uh, group. And it really is that, I mean, it's like a 12 step yeah. writers. It really is. <laughs> we laugh, we cry almost every week. There are yeah. tears or, you know, the rest yeah. of it. Um, and then, uh, we meet a couple of times as well to do working sessions during the, during the week to write together. Yeah. I don't yeah. even think I knew that. That's so cool. Yeah. 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 We do. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's amazing. It's awesome. And, and, you know, it's a mix of being able to share, um, experience and skills and expertise. But the big thing for me is that it's that, it's that feeling that somebody else out there gets it. It's a yeah. very, this is a very unique role I, I haven't had in my professional career before. And so it's very, I, I'm, I'm, I feel a little lost at sea sometimes, if that makes sense. And so much of this is happening inside our heads and at our computers alone, that having the community is just, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a no, it's a no brain. Absolutely. Yeah. I love them. I love them. Do you know how proud of you? I am. Oh, stop. <laughs> I really, really am because I'm really, I'm, I'm glad you reminded me of how we first connected because I'd forgotten that whole, I'm not a writer and I'm not going to write a book, but, um, <laughs> and, and now that you're an expert. Well, and it was interesting actually, cause I, I originally, like I said, I picked up the, the memoir book and this book actually did start as a memoir yes. and it, the, it was the, uh, the understanding of structure where all of a sudden I thought, okay, my life is not this dramatic. And this is, like, this is actually not, it was a couple of things. It was that, but the other thing is, and this is, this is something I just find fascinating about writing fiction is that particularly if, if it's something that has some, um, you know, personal basis or there's, 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 I mean, I guess we should all be writing about what we know anyway, but is this experience that I definitely had in the first drafting process of going in and kind of changing your narrative. So my, memoir or my life was going a certain way and I could change anything I wanted. And look at this, I brought in a brand new character now. And like, it's a real story, right? And it excites me. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's, which makes me feel even more driven to write it and to be with it. Like I really, yes. I really enjoy this story. If that and also you've had that amazing experience that people who fictionalize memoirs have is that the, the characters that you were writing about in the beginning had a, had the basis in a real human being a lot, right? And then they change and they become their own fictional human who is real to us. And it's this, and I've had the same experience. It's this relief of like, well, now I don't have to worry about even thinking about that person because this is a new person that I have created and I get to move around the page. Yes. How has that felt? That has been amazing. And I feel like that's something I always heard that writers would say, like, I put the characters on the page and they make decisions and I'm not it. I'm like, mm, I don't think it works like that. Uh, mm, I don't think so. But it's true. You get into these, 
it's this, it's this experience of being, I guess it's the flow basically, yeah. right? Like you're in a place where all of a sudden it's just the characters really are making decisions and their, their, their motivations. I think if we can understand the character's motivations as we're writing, and that's something that I have learned through this process, the editing process now that I didn't know about the first drafting process is that the motivations of characters are very, very important. And I think, you know, you can't do everything in what in the first draft, right? And so the fact that I was able to pull off structure, I guess by the second draft, if I was able to pull off structure, that's a great start. Um, but that's something I'm, as a writer, I'm going to try to focus more on now is um, just making sure that the characters are, are complex enough and that the reader really understands why they're making decisions um, as opposed to just kind of ticking along with the plot. And I will point out that I think you're finding this too, is that that's, that's a place where many writers struggle, myself included. And that is something that will always be in my text. When I get it back from an editor, they say, I don't understand the motivation. And my brain always goes, wait, but I understand the motivation. And I realize that over five or seven drafts or whatever it is, I either put in too much and then took it all out, or I never bothered to say it because it's in my mind. I know what they're doing and why they're doing it. But it, we can really use that outside pair of professional eyes to say, no, it didn't, it didn't come across here. If there was a good, if there was a good reason you need to show it. And, and frankly, that was probably one of the sentences that was the most destroying actually yeah. was not understanding motivation. All, I mean, that word, yeah. I just was like, yeah. she doesn't understand the motivation behind this. Like how, that, that the whole story has to be thrown out, right? The whole thing is a mess. If, you know, does that make sense? Like it, it was, makes total sense. And, and that feeling is absolutely real. The feeling you have is real. However, it's one of those feelings that can be fixed by two or three sentences in a scene. Yes. Yeah. It's <laughs> you know? so true. It's so true, which I don't think we see yeah. until we do the scene outline. Right. So, I mean, my scene outline is very similar. As you know, during the revision process, I was all about post-its. In fact, I would say the first thing is if you're going through any kind of drafting process, like buy stock in 3M, because I have so many post-its and then it be, kind of becomes like a thing. Like I have the little mini ones and I have bigger ones and I have ones that like go like this, like a deck of cards and you have some lying around. Without even that. reaching, like I've got two sizes right here. Like, I don't, yeah, I don't have to, I don't have to go anywhere. Yeah. No, me neither. Somebody gave me actually the other day, uh, I don't know how big they are. They're probably what, like three feet by three feet. Yeah. I mean, it's just, there's those. a whole thing. Yeah. Um, but for, for the editing, I found that the way that I used the post-its in revision was more like something came to me while I was in the manuscript, I need to capture it. Mm -hmm. Whereas the editing is a much more um, methodical process, if that makes sense. And, and I, I'm not, I'm definitely getting ideas as I'm, yes. you know, in life and out for walks and the rest of it that I'm, I'm, I'm emailing to myself but I'm not as linked to the post-it process in editing as I was in revising because I already know what it is I want to change. It's just, how do I do it? Yes. Yeah. You are saying all of this so beautifully and it excites me so much that we get to talk about this because this is a really, really high level conversation about what a working writer does with a manuscript. And I don't think I've ever had this conversation on this show. Which is why, which is why I told you today I'm pushing this out tomorrow, and I'm bumping all of those authors that are still in the queue that have been in the queue for months, um, because this is so so exciting to me, and I am so damn proud of you. So, um, can you give us uh, a little bit of a uh, an idea of where you're going to go with this book, and then also tell us about um, what you are doing confronting your inner critic this um, course? Yes, yes. So, I mean, my plan with the book. So the other thing that the editor did that I, that I completely uh, uh, missed was she actually suggested a publisher in the first like two or three sentences. She was like, this is a great book. And here's I a love that you missed it. it. <laughs> I mean, I just went, I went dark. I went deep. I went dark. I was like, she doesn't like the motivation of one of the characters. I'm absolutely <laughs> fucked. This is just like, uh, it's all over. Um, so my plan is to get it. My plan is to get it published. My plan is to, um, I have no idea how long it's going to take to do these edits, because like you said, it could be like two or three sentences here. Yep. It could be creating another character. The backstory is a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. uh, meaty. So, um, just because I work so well with deadlines, I'd like to, my, my, my goal now is to have this scene outline thing done by Monday and go into the manuscript on Monday, which is like, you know, Bamps, if you're out there, I'm going to be calling and like holding your hands. That's my writing group or our writing group. I'm going to be like holding your hands. I need you. I need you. Um, but I'm going to go back in and then roll through the edits and, and, uh, and improve the book. And then my editor offered one more round of 
edits, I guess you yeah. could call. Yeah. And not- many editors will do that. Not all, but that can be something that is negotiable yeah. and it is, um, it's, it's a good idea. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'll do that. And then I guess I go down the road that, you know, the <laughs> creating, creating agents and the rest yes. of it. Uh, so that is the plan, but the, uh, the confronting your inner critic, I'm glad you asked because, um, the other thing that I've been doing throughout all of this process is, you know, talked about changing the narrative. And a lot of this is waking up one day and feeling like I'm not a writer. I'm going to quit. I have so many reasons to quit. Nobody, especially in the first drafting process. I mean, I, I don't know if everybody does this, but for me with the first drafting process, I didn't even tell anybody I was writing a book until the first draft was done. Yeah, but you told us. That's the thing. You had people supporting you. Ninety. The the, the statistic is ninety seven percent of people who start books don't finish them, and I really believe that is because we need some kind of support. Yes, somewhere. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Because it is so easy to just stop. It's so easy to stop. It's so easy to stop. Um, so during all this, during all the writing and the rest of it, I have been making um, art on cardboard of all things, and these are actually cardboard pieces behind me. They're gorgeous. Um, but it was another place besides the page to go and just make mistakes. I mean, cardboard is free. It's like everywhere, right? And so I would make this art that would reflect some important quote or some important ism. Oftentimes they were isms that came out of your class. Um, some of the bants definitely know some of my isms. And they were because they were words that resonated with me as opposed to, um, you know, I remember Julia Cameron, the artist way had this idea that that writers uh, or, or artists, I guess, should create these affirmations, right? So you write like, I don't know, 10, 20, 30, 50 times. I am a brilliant and prolific writer. And I tried that. And those aren't my words. That, that's not how I see myself. And it's also not the words I would use. Mm-hmm. So I found the words that worked for me. And I started hanging my art all around where I was writing. And it's been a very, very, very powerful way for me to tame or confront my own inner critic. And so I am just, I am overjoyed at the possibility of sharing this with other creatives. I mean, anybody could be, could be um, plagued by their inner critic, right? It doesn't have to be. Everyone is. Creating. Yeah. Everyone is. Everyone yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that is uh, that's my way forward. Gorgeous. Where can people go to follow you so that they know about this when it launches? So right now, that's a, that's also a great question right now, my website is being built. And so the easiest way to, um, get in touch with me is to email me. Uh, my email is Eileen at stacksstudio.com, And that's a Y L E N E at S T A X S T U D I O. So stackstudio.com. And, and I'll put that in the, sh- the show notes. Are you on Instagram as well? That's sometimes an easy way for people. I'm sneaking in there slowly. That would okay. be, Eileen, that would be Eileen Lambert. Yeah. You could try me there too. Okay. That's a, that's a, that's a nice place because you'll be posting yes. pictures yes. of your work and of the book. <laughs> Eileen, thank you so much for, for doing this, for suggesting it, for reaching out and for those absolutely two joyous emails that you sent me after you had the breakthroughs. Like you sent me one that made my life. And then you sent me another one that said, I I need to talk more about this. And I needed to talk to you about this. Um, I'm well, thank you for the opportunity because it really is such a shift. And I would hate to think that there is anybody out there who's, I keep calling it the the cliff. The other thing I love to call it is the dip, right? You go down like this and actually writing is a lot of this. There are a a lot lot of of falling off the cliff into the dip. And crawling back up to the top of the cliff where the sunset is gorgeous and everything is fine. And then you just, you, you fall off again. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And to remember that, you yeah. know, to, to remember that when you're in the dip, the other thing about a dip for some reason, I know this is a, just like a biological thing, but for some reason, after a dip, there's always a surge. Yes. There always that's where I am right now. Yes. I went down and I was like, okay, I'm just not going to do anything else. This is fine. And then all of a sudden when it clicked, the surge is here. So now I'm in the surge. You get to see me in the surge. <laughs> I have seen you in the surge before and I, it is a glorious thing to witness. Eileen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I can't so much tell you how much I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. We'll talk soon. Thanks.